suppose, Enoch's brother. There's a whole slew of winds all over Mexico, and now they even have one of the daughters and her husband's missionaries in Alaska. Can you imagine living in Mexico City all your life, and then you go to Alaska? So what a, what a, what a culture shock and great difference in temperatures, too. But anyway, it says, in August, we had a total of 809 souls won for Christ. In September, we had 1,470 souls saved. We continued faithfully soul winning and running our routes. Thank you for faithfully giving to the missions so that we may bring many people to church for each service. I received a message that there was a family interested in church in the area, and I went to visit them, uh, one of them uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, thankfully, that same night, a lady named Brenda was saved at her home. They came to church the following day and her two children and two grandchildren. Her son, Jamie, was saved and baptized that night. Her granddaughter, Melanie, was saved later that week and baptized later on a Wednesday night. Another family joined our church after a tragedy led to the loss of their six-year-old daughter. Uh, Lilia, uh, the mother, was saved years ago in a Baptist church, but had married and left the church long ago. She wanted a Baptist preacher to do the funeral service for her daughter and called me. I was very happy to preach the funeral and have several people saved afterwards. Since that time, her husband and teen son, Mario have been saved. Mario uh, has been attending faithfully and soul winning since he was baptized last month. Mexico's Independence Day was in September and we always celebrate with a big day and Mexican meals after church. We also celebrated five years of planting our church here in Ensenada. Uh, we are so grateful for all the blessings of the past years. We've seen thousands of souls saved and many lives changed. We are thankful for the opportunity and privilege to serve Christ here on the mission field. Thank you for your prayers and support over the years. On our big day, we had 347 people in attendance and 12 baptisms. We invited and announced in the streets for five days leading up to Sunday. We were so grateful for the amount of people who came to church that night. Our members get together, to, uh, get together and prepare different mix Mexican dishes, and everyone dresses in traditional Mexican attire to celebrate. We had more than enough food, and everyone went home full and happy to have been in the Lord's house. My wife and I were able to drive our newest bus on the big day and fill it up between our two routes. In total, we ran four transports all over the city. We also held a baptism campaign during the month of September, and we're happy to have triple our regular number of baptisms. Many of our baptisms were first-time visitors, and some were regulars that had never taken the step in obedience. We have seen growth in these new members and their families. Thank you for faithfully giving and investing in us and our ministry through prayer and financially. Our family also prays for each of you. God bless Joe and Kella Wynn. So very fruitful field, Mexico. Uh, of course, same thing is happening all over Mexico, there in Mexico City and there in Ensenada. And uh, grateful for these folks. I'm gonna read something else to you. You don't have this, but uh, it's a prayer requests concerning one of our missionaries, uh, Fred and Beth Minnett, who uh, ministered to the Jews. Uh, i just read this to you. Uh, it says, family and friends, well, the news is all good today, though maybe not the same as you and I were praying. Beth's blood pressure uh, uh, is staying up. Oh, a normal byproduct of the aortic dissection or tear. So let me pause here. Uh, apparently, at some point, she had a, a pretty significant tear in her aorta. Honestly, I didn't know you could live through something like that, but she survived. And so there had been a series of emails coming, and we just got all of them. So, like, this is like, whoa, when did this happen? So I tried contacting him today just to let him know we'd be praying for her. But I, I'm not sure when she tore it or all the details, but uh, she is still hospitalized. It says uh, her hospital. Hospitalist and cardiovascular surgeon have weighed the heavy risk of letting her go home as is and have wisely opted to keep her here until extended top numbers of under 120 are the norm for at least one day. The extreme risk danger of going home with questionable numbers is that the ongoing high blood pressure on the tear could break through the second layer of the aorta and push the outer layer out, aneurysm which is extremely dangerous, so this will be my last update for a while. Know that if there is a radical positive change in her condition, 
uh, pressures drop, stays down, she goes home, or negative change, conditions worsens, etc. I'll let you know immediately. Until then, please continue to pray for stability and drastic reduction of her blood pressure and successful insertion of the stent in God's timing. Um, uh, love you all and highly value your friendship and prayers. They are effectual, Fred and Beth Bennett. So uh, I guess the, the goal is for her to uh, get the blood pressure down and then go home, uh, have recuperation and strengthening for two solid weeks, and then go back in and insert a stent into the aorta. So that's something I, maybe that's common. You know, I'm no doctor, so I wouldn't know. But uh, certainly sounds serious, so if you would, just pray for Beth. They're good missionaries, and we've supported them for years and years and years. Done a really tremendous job. Let me also mention a new request that we're going to add tonight there on your prayer list, so you want to write this down. Randy Plogger. This is a friend of Mike and Joe Nice Warner's, and, he, and I, I didn't know this. I didn't know they were friends. He's also one of my students. Probably the last two or three years I've taught him down at Mountaineer Baptist. Uh, he is a pastor. He's not a, he's not a young man. He's probably mid-50s, something like that, maybe early 50s. Well, he developed cancer in one of his lungs, and he went to have part of the lung removed. And uh, uh, when I was at school on Monday night, they told me that things have not gone well. He's developed pneumonia, and they had to take out more of the lung than they thought. And plus, he's developed blood clots. Now, according to what Mike and Joan said, he has stage 4 cancer, because that's severe. Randy Plogger is P-L-A-U-G-H-E-R, Randy Plogger. Good... I don't know about her name. Is is it that's his wife? Okay. Yeah, he he pastors a, a church down past Salem somewhere, but uh, good man. So, really be in prayer for him and his whole family. I don't think they were expecting quite that news. So, uh, just pray that God will intervene for him in a special way. Uh, all right. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I get these things now, it's like something affects me. I don't know if it's like it's uh, something that makes me get an allergic reaction for about a day and then it goes away and you know, it'll just kind of pop up randomly. And So if I sniffle tonight, I'm not sick. I don't know what it is, it just drives you nuts. All right, we'll go ahead now. We'll just open up to any requests that you have or any updates that you have on anybody. So Jeff? Was his first name Berlin? Berlin. Berlin. Right, so Berlin witty with dementia. Okay, anyone else tonight? Okay, Mrs. McCardle. Have, have McCardle's ever been up here? I can't. I couldn't remember. I know we've. Prayed for him a lot during the years. It's a hand surgery. Okay, anyone else? Any other requests tonight? Kathy or Kathy Connie. You said that's with your dad? Okay. Okay, all right, we'll pray for Mr. Posey with that. I said Kathy because you said the name Kathy and then it just came out. I, I know who you are. So. I never, don't worry about it because I do that to everybody. It's because I'm getting younger, that's why. I keep calling, calling Cassie Chloe and Chloe Cassie. They've been here for how many years now? And I continually do it. And I think now it's such a thing in my mind 
that it's like my mind garbles when I see them. Oh, well. I, I should do like my home pastor did. He just called everybody friend. Well, hello, friend. How are you today? And I, as a kid growing up, I was like, oh, man, I am his friend. And then I found out that everybody was his friend. It wasn't such a big deal after all. So anyway, anything else? Anything else? Okay. Midterms? Oh, oh, those midterms. I was thinking, I didn't know you were in school. <laughs> midterms? Yeah, we do need to pray about that. All right, midterm elections on November 8th. In fact, we are going to vote, I think, tomorrow, because I'm not sure we'll be back in time to vote. So we're going to go ahead and get it done early. All right. You also notice there Josh and Ashley Finnis, Finna, Finnis, Josh and Ashley, who are here for a long time there. The, the adoption is for a little girl that they've been uh, caring for for a long time. It's little, uh, I think she's part of the, what they call the Induit tribe, I think, up there in Alaska. So um, there's been some roadblocks for them, but they want her, and uh, so pray for that. And then that kind of reminded me about what's going on with Chris and Ray. They're, they're seeking to adopt, so just put their names there as well. All righty, we'll go ahead and put those to the side then tonight. And let me make sure here. All right, all right. We'll go ahead and grab our Bibles and go to the book of Proverbs again tonight. Book of Proverbs. I started last week in our study of Proverbs, a section that I call Things That Encourage. Things That Encourage. And uh, we got about halfway through, so just kind of as a reminder, we'll go back to Proverbs 12.25. Proverbs 12.25. These statements that you read are not necessarily saying you need to go and encourage this person in this area but I am applying that, I'm making application that way to these, these just true statements that are given to us in Proverbs. So let's have prayer, we'll get right into it. Father, I thank you again for being here tonight. I thank you for everyone that's made their way out. You know, Father, it's uh, changing, the weather is cold, it's been damp today, it gets dark early. Uh, all those things uh, could tend to make it difficult just to get up and come, but these folks have been faithful to come to your house, so Lord, bless them for it. Lord, I just pray for, again, as already been prayed for, those who are teaching tonight in Awana, those teaching in the team ministry, all that's going on in this building, that you be honored and glorified through it. And Lord, use me as well, and we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 12, I want you to look again at the 25th verse. And it says, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. And that's just, in a sense, a statement of fact. That's the reality. So when I say things that encourage, I'm talking about you thinking in the terms of what can I do to help somebody whose, whose heart is struggling, who has heaviness of heart. And one of the things you can do is just speak a good word. The word good means just that, something good, something pleasant, something kind, something sweet. Uh, Monday, I was talking with an individual, and they're going through a really, really rough time. A lot of tears right now, uh, a lot of loneliness, and it just gave me an opportunity just to speak words of encouragement, just a pleasant word. Why? Well, because the person's heart is stooping. And so you look at that, and you say, you know, I can do that. I may not have all the solutions for that person, but I can certainly try to speak a word of encouragement. I, I wrote Randy this afternoon, just wrote him a, like a get well card, and uh, I know he he's, has an uphill battle, but just little words of encouragement sometimes can get a person over the hump. Back, uh, by the way, my, my little nephew, my grandnephew, came through his open heart surgery well yesterday and, and did very, very well, so grateful for that. But when, I, when Chris was, and you've heard this story before, but it just kind of lends to this. Uh, when Chris was in such critical condition, I remember at a point there down in Atlanta, it was just like I came to that edge. 
like I was going to fall over the edge. And God sent Grant Smith down to Eggleston Hospital at Emory University, and he walked out into that garden where I was sitting, found me, and I, I cannot even tell you the words that he said, but it's almost like, I mean this literally, like, like I could just feel the Holy Spirit push me back away from the edge. Just, just a good word. It just helped me, you know, get past that stooping heart, if you will, the, the heavy heart. So a good word. Look for ways to encourage people. Sometimes it's just a sweet, a pleasant, a kind word that will just help somebody. Maybe you will be the instrument to help push them back from the edge. You never know. You just never know. The second thing we looked at is found in chapter 13 and verse 12. And there it says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Now, that, that's a statement of fact. When you have something you, you greatly desire, something that you are hoping for and it doesn't happen, well, that can be a bummer. You know, that, that can make, in a sense, your heart sick. But when that hope, that desire is fulfilled, it is refreshing. It, it can be life-changing, and we understand that. Now, you say, I don't have the power to make people's hopes come into reality, nor do I. That's a God thing. I cannot make someone's hope become reality. I can't make their desire come. But you stop and think about the word hope, and the word hope which means expectation or confidence, and you think in terms of what we're told in the book of Romans. Twice in the book of Romans you hear these words, Romans 12, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing in pr instant in prayer. Rejoice, not, not in the answer to your expectation, not to the answer for your desire, but rejoice in hope itself. That you have a confidence that whatever it is will happen. And we, we use by example Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We all have that hope. We're all Christians here. We're all born-again people in this room tonight. We all have the hope of the blessed coming of Jesus Christ. And you know what? Has it happened yet? No. We're still looking for it. But you know what encourages me? Is to hear men preach about the blessed hope. To hear men address that subject. One, it is... To me, other than salvation itself, it's the ultimate subject. Because now that I've met him and he lives within me, I want to see him face to face. And that's what Hebrews chapter uh, 13 refers to, seeing him one day, or 1 John chapter 3 rather, seeing him face to face. That's, that's going to be the ultimate for you and me. We've already met him spiritually, now we get to meet him face to face. So that's a great hope. There's also Romans 15, verse 13, and it says this, Now the God of hope, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may, be, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Again, not the fulfillment of the hope, but abound in hope itself. So it, it doesn't have to concern necessarily the second coming of Christ. That's the blessed hope. But there are other things that we hope for. Are you hoping for someone to be saved that you love? Are you hoping for a promised promotion that you were supposed to get a year or two ago and you got passed over? And somebody's saying, well, you know what, you got the qualifications and the boss really likes you. It's, it's going to happen. Just hold on. You know, whatever the hope may be, whatever your desire may be, I can't make that happen, but I can encourage someone in that. Look, hold on to your hope. Believe the God of hope so that you can abound in that hope because it will come to pass. It will come to pass. And then the next thing we looked at, we left off here last week, and that's Proverbs. We'll go to Proverbs 17, verse 22 first. We saw some different verses here, and that concerns a merry heart. 
Proverbs 17, verse 22, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Back also in chapter 15, verse 13 says, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but, a sor but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. And then verse 15, All the day of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. So it's a big deal to have a merry heart. It literally changes your whole perspective, doesn't it? If I am discouraged, depressed, looking at things negatively, that's going to change my perspective on everything. It will affect my attitude when I walk into this place. I lean toward negativism in, in my natural state. I'm the glass half full, not, or the glass half empty, not the glass half full. That's, that's just my makeup. And that's that's a, not a good way to look at life. And so some of, some of us, I don't know if anybody else is like that, in a sense, we've got to work a little bit harder than the others who are just naturally, hey, yay, everything's great. You know, I don't come in and say everything's great. You know, I'd be quick to point out the negative things. That's, that's my personality and my flesh. You know, that's why the flesh is just a stinking object, isn't it? Wouldn't you be glad to get rid of this? Anyway. So a merry heart, a glad heart, and that's really what he's talking about. Now, you say, I can't do that either. I can't make somebody who looks at life negatively. I can't make somebody who is heavy in heart necessarily have a merry heart. No, you can't necessarily in yourself, but maybe the word of God can help you in it. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, you look over at Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. You already know this verse. A lot of you have it memorized, but just for the sake of it, I look over there at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul makes a statement. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. And then he throws this one in. It's in, in, in retrospect of what we just read about, about uh, truth, honesty, justice, then he's, and, and purity, then he says, whatsoever things are lovely. Lovely. Well, what's lovely? The sunset? You know, lilies popping up after a cold winter? You know, the smile of a grandchild as they run into, into your presence? You know, lovely things. Uh, just having a sweet day with your spouse. You went out somewhere and just spent the day together. Just lovely things. Whatsoever things are lovely. Now, I, I know I'm kind of minimizing that word lovely there, but, I mean, you could think about that in those physical terms, and you could stretch that to just sitting around thinking about who Jesus really is. He's the friend of sinners. He's, he's the gentle one. He's the servant. That's exactly what the Old Testament refers to him as, as the servant. He's a servant to his father. He's a servant to men. He's the great physician, and on and on. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, do what? Think on these things. Focus on these things. Meditate on these things. Get your mind on the good things. Meditate on those good things, those glad things that are going to... So what, what would I do if I found someone who's real down? Might be, it'd be advisable to say, where's your mind at right now? What are you thinking about? and just encourage them. Think, think about glad things. Think about things that God has done for you already. Think about the things that God has already proven himself to you. You know, a lot of times when I begin to doubt, when I begin to get fearful, you know what God does? He makes me go back and remember the past. He makes me go back and remember the great things he hath done. And we sing that, great things he hath done. That's true, isn't it? Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And he has. So sometimes, whether it's for yourself or even for others, to help redirect somebody's heavy heart 
to thinking about, if you will, merry things or glad things, gleeful things, think of those terms. All right, so that's where we left off last week. Now I want you to go look at Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, I want you to look at verse 30. And he says, The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. Read that again. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. Now, encouraging somebody, with a good report, if you will. Uh, just focus on the first half of the verse for a moment. The light of the eyes. The light of the eyes. Well, wh what is the light of the eyes? Well, if you had been born blind, the first day you see would be light of the eyes. I just give you this by the example. In John chapter 9, Jesus and the disciples are in Jerusalem, and they come across a man, and the scripture says... He was born blind from, his, from the day of his birth. He was born blind. And there was an assumption made by the disciples. They said to Jesus, who did sin, his parents or him, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. This is for God's manifestation of his work. This is the reason this man has been born blind. Not because he sinned or, you know, God, you know, in his foreknowledge, you know, knew that this man would one day sin. No, it wasn't for that, nor was it for the fact that his parents did something wicked and wrong. That's not the reason this man was born blind, but that God's power, God's work could be made manifest through this man. You know, sometimes when bad things happen to people, whether it's blindness or deafness or whatever, you stop and consider that it may just be very much so that God can manifest his power or that God can just simply get glory through their life. Not every tragedy in our life is a tragedy in God's eyes. Sometimes God means it to be used for good. So anyway, light. What does that mean? Well, you know what it means. It means to be illuminated. You, you, you get to see, if you will. This blind man all of a sudden saw. And after he saw, he was confronted by the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, of course, finding out that Jesus was the one that healed him, became irate, and they said, this man is not of God. This man is not of God. And, and the, the blind man is there. And I don't know much about theology, you know, but I will tell you this, verse 25, whether this man be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, once I was blind, now I see. All I know is I used to not be able to be illumined at all. Now my eyes have been opened. My eyes have been illuminated. The light, again, verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart. And that blind man was rejoicing because he was experiencing something he had never, ever experienced before. All right? I cannot restore people's sight. I can't do that. That is a God thing. There have been people whose eyes have been restored, not only in the days of Jesus, but others have had their eyes restored. But that's not a man thing. I cannot do that. But there is something I can do to bring illumination. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy word giveth what? Light. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. I may not be able to give someone physical sight, but God can use me by way of encouragement to give people spiritual light. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and the 14th verse? Ye are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. If people are going to come out of darkness, it's going to be because of your light. It's going to be because of your light. And your light can rejoice those people's hearts when they come to know the truth of who the true light is. John chapter 1, who are we told is the light? We're told that Jesus Christ is the light. And I have an opportunity to encourage someone to see spiritual light. I can do that in witnessing to a lost man, but I can also do it for a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe God has given you uh, a, an understanding of some portion of God's word that the brother or sister that is struggling does not yet know. And 
God can use you because of the things that you have gone through to go to that person and shed, as we like to say, light on the situation. And that could cause them to rejoice in their heart. And then the second half of the verse says, and a good report maketh the bones fat. A good report maketh the, the bones fat. The attitude is a good, good tidings, you know, good tidings of great joy. Good tidings, or what is the gospel? What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. So he says this, the last part of that verse, and a good report make the bones fat. Now let's equate that to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I as born-again believers are called on to give good news in order to change someone's life. We just read that report from Joe and Kella down there in Ensenada, there in Mexico. By the way, that's a heavily uh, cartel area, uh, literally, that is heavy cartel. And uh, when you pray for Joe and Kella, you need to pray for their physical safety, for their children's safety. That is a very bad area. They're on the west coast of Mexico. But you know what? <clears throat> it's obvious that God has used them all, all these years to turn a lot of people from blindness to the light of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they are constantly, constantly giving out the good news, a good report of what Jesus Christ can do. It says it maketh the bones fat. It maketh the bones fat. That's my problem. I got fat bones. That's, that's my problem. That, that was supposed to be funny. Obviously, it wasn't, so we'll go on. But look at Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And look at verses 3 and 4. This is the opposite of this. When I kept silence, my bone waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the draught of summer, Selah. Why did he say that? Verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. The reason for this heaviness, the dryness of his bones, was because of unconfessed sin. And for a believer, when sin goes unconfessed, it's not dealt with. When we hold on to sin and we try to hide it, God will not let us rest. He'll make us miserable in it. He'll make us miserable in it. I've had it happen to me. Maybe you've had it happen to you, where you try to cover some sin, and then God's Holy Spirit just begins to pound at you and pound at you until eventually it just, in a sense, wears you out, just like he's talking about here. And then, you know what, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. I'm grateful that God loves me that much. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son, every child that he receiveth. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And so he said, we are to encourage people with a good report. For the lost, the good report, the good news of the gospel. For a believer that may be struggling with some uh, habit or some secret sin, the good news of this gospel that can lead them back to a victorious life. And then next, I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 24. Again, we're talking about things that encourage. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. Pleasant words. He said pleasant words are sweet to the soul. And here he talks about being health to the bones. And he talked about, you know, fat of the bones, so to speak. Here he talks about health to the bones from pleasant words. When you look up the word pleasant, one of the words that defines the word, I mean, we understand the word pleasant, but one of the words that helps define the word pleasant is grace. Grace. If you were to go and look up that word pleasant, you would find that part of the definition to be grace. And that made me think of Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace. Let your speech be always with grace. Let your words always be pleasant words. Now, I, I know there are times where you have to, like for those of you who are uh, you know, raising your children right now, there, there are times your words, when a child is just out and out rebellious, your words may not sound real pleasant. 
So I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, give a wrong impression here that there are not times for sternness in speech. Uh, those things are necessary. I'm called on as a pastor to reprove and rebuke people. That's two of my chief uh, issues that God tells me I must as a pastor do. I must preach to the people and reprove them and rebuke them. Okay? We understand that. But in general, he said, I want your words to be pleasant words. You know how many children have been destroyed because a parent used unpleasant words to their children growing up? I can't stand you. And then they'll compare that child to some other person they know or some relative that's not a good person. You're just like, or I wish you were never, do parents ever tell you that? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately they do. And through unpleasant words they destroy. Words that are not filled with grace they destroy. They begin to tear down a life. And a child grows up with those things and they, unfortunately, they never ever forget them. When they're 20, when they're 30, when they're 50, when they're 70, till the day they die, they will never ever forget what their parents said to them. We need to speak words that are pleasant to people. Our, our speech needs always to be with grace. And then he says, seasoned with salt. Always tasty, if you will. There's nothing worse than eating something that's bland. You know, you, you fry an egg. That's not really that all that good. Put some salt and pepper on it, then it's good. You know, that's just the way it is. He said, let your speech be the same way. So encourage people with pleasant words. Proverbs 15, 26 says this, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but words of the pure are pleasant words. Sometimes the reason our words are not pleasant words is because everything we are filtering into this computer called the mind is only going to cause us to speak unpleasant words. We have to be very careful. So I'm going to go to a new section. We'll go through a couple of these tonight. Well, it's very short, so we may go through all of this before we close the night. I call this the consequences of lying. Now remember, as we go through this, from chapter 10 through chapter 23 or 24, there's just these short proverbs, and as you look at the different chapters, you'll find uh, uh, this particular verse over here in chapter 13, and a verse over here in chapter 17, and a verse in chapter 12. They all refer to the same subject, so we're just taking them, grouping them together, and gaining thoughts from it. So. He speaks a fair amount about a liar. So I call this the consequences of lying. And I begin by saying this, a liar is. Go to chapter 12, verse 17. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 17. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. A false witness deceit. So what do you... What do you uh, conclude there about someone who's a liar? A liar is deceitful. That's their character. They're deceitful. I remember when I raised my kids, um, kids lie. You know, they, you know, there's a broken vase in a room, and you walk in, and all four of your kids, who did it? Come on, fess up. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, you know I just, you just walked out of the room. The vase was fine. The four kids there. And then the vase breaks, and then suddenly, magically, it just broke itself. How is that possible? Now, you all have had to deal with those kind of things. Kids know how to lie, just like mom and dad know how to lie, just like preachers know how to lie. I just heard today someone make a statement. All politicians lie, left and right, all politicians, no exceptions. Everyone lies. Now, I don't know if that's exactly true, but I, I do know this. We all struggle in this area. So he says, all liars are deceitful. Look at chapter 12, verse 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And I just put it this way. A liar is short-lived. A liar is short-lived. You say, well, I know someone who's been lying all their life, and now they're an old man. He's gone through life just lying, getting advantage. 
this way and over that way over people by his lying mouth. And everybody knows it. But the scripture says it's just for a moment. And then it made me think about 2 Peter 3.8. A thousand years is like a day to the Lord. You realize we have all eternity. You are an eternal being. You will never die. That's, that's what Jesus said to Martha and Mary. I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me shall never die. And then he looked at her and says, do you believe that? I can never die. My body can because it's still corrupt, but I cannot die. I cannot die, nor can you if you're born again. So I have all eternity. But normally when we think in terms of people who are habitual liars, we think about someone who does not know Christ. And their life is a vapor that appears for a little time, a little time, and then vanishes away. And they may make it through lifeline, and it may be that nasty politician that gets through life lying their way through to whatever god says it's just for a moment it's just for a moment don't you go after their wicked ways and then in the same chapter verse 22 lying lips are an abomination to the lord but they that deal truly are his delight lying lips are an abomination to the lord a liar is deceitful a liar is short-lived a liar is an abomination now, a lot of times when we think about abomination, we think about the big, bad, ugly sins. You know, some of what we talked, preached about Sunday, those, those kind of things. God says, you lie, you're an abomination to me. You disgust me. That's really the attitude of an abomination. You disgust me. Uh, there is a passage here in Proverbs where he lists lying, the the. the Yea, uh, six things God hates, and seven are an abomination to him. And, and two of the seven are speaking about lying. He hates it. So I used to tell my kids when they would lie. I never finished that. I said, the worst thing you can ever do is lie. Because when you lie to me, I do not know if I can ever trust you. And I taught my kids that very early. You learn to tell the truth because when you lie... You break trust with me, and I do not know that I can ever trust you now or ever. Do not lie to me. So I'd, I'd encourage you parents, not by way of threat, but by way of reality. When people lie to you, you do not trust them. Nor do you know if you can ever trust them. Children need to learn to tell the truth, no matter the consequences. They need to learn this. And then one more thing about a liar is, a liar is, Proverbs 17, 7. Go over there to that passage. It says, excellent speech belongs not to a fool, much less to lying lips, a prince. So you surmise by that, that a liar is a fool. That's what God says, not me. A liar is a fool. So a liar is deceitful, a liar is short-lived, a liar is an abomination, a liar is a fool. And then take a look at the character of a liar. Go over to chapter 14 of Proverbs and look at verse 5. Proverbs 14 and verse 5. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Notice the word utter. Again, when you look at the richness of definition of words, it just helps enhance. And we all know what utter means. It means talk, speak, to utter something. I'm uttering right now. Anyway, I was going to try to make a joke, but it wouldn't have made any sense. I won't. So we utter things. I'm doing that again right now. But it also carries with it the attitude of this, kindling a fire. To utter means kindling a fire. And you know what happens when you kindle a fire? Many times it gets out of control. And it does far more damage than you would ever want it to do. Some guy goes out there in the middle of dry season in California, and they sit down. All they're going to do is just go out there in the wilderness area and just have a nice time with their kids. And, you know, they've taken all the safety precautions. You know, they've, they've put stone around the fire pit, and they make sure the brush is away. And so they just build a small fire just to roast some hot dogs, marshmallows, kind of like we did Sunday night. But you know, 
They said no, no fires, period, none at all. Sometimes we do that around here, no fires. And a little ember goes up and carries over and hits dry brush and all of a sudden you have a raging fire that's gonna destroy you know, 250 homes and take five or six lives and do billions and billions worth of dollars in damage just from a little fire that somebody thought they could control but could not. That's the way, that's the way lying can be. He cannot help but utter lies. He kindles fires with his wicked mouth and that is the character of a liar. That's the character of a liar. Secondly, you look at the same chapter, verse 25, 14, verse 25, a true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful wit witness speaketh lies. So not only is he deceitful, but, but he is, in a sense, deceit itself. He does not deliver people, he ensnares people. He, he is deceit itself. Next thing I want you to notice is concerning the same thing about the character of a liar. He is motivated by a naughty tongue. That's what is said here in chapter 17. Look at the fourth verse. Proverbs 17 and verse 4. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty person. Where, where does the man or the woman... Uh, feel justified or even comfortable in a pattern and a lifestyle of lying. Well, we know that Jesus taught that it's not what you take into the body that defiles the body, but it's what comes out of the mouth. It's really what comes out of the heart. For out of the heart are adulteries, fornications, and he just lists all these sins one of the reasons that people struggle with lying is because of the influence they have had. This liar is motivated, notice that at the end of that verse, he's motivated by a naughty tongue. And again, we've looked at that word naughty earlier. It doesn't mean, oh, naughty, naughty. You shouldn't pull your little friend's pigtail. That's naughty, naughty. It's cute, but it's naughty. You shouldn't do that. No, no. Naughty is wickedness and perverseness. That's what the word means. He's motivated by the naughty tongue, the perverse and wicked tongue. In other words, his influences are influences of wickedness, and that what gives him the go-ahead and the justification to be an habitual liar, to be man characterized or woman characterized by lying. And I thought to myself, what did Jesus say about Satan? Go back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, look at verse 44. Of course, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and they say, we're Abraham's seed, and all that stuff, and there's this almost, almost like an argument, if you will, and Jesus makes a statement to those people, verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Where do people get off on lying? What makes them feel justified? Because they're listening to the wicked one. The wicked one is influencing them. He's the father of lies. And people feel justified, whether it's a politician or whether it's just your average Brother Bill person sometimes feel justified to lie because of their father. Listen, understand this. I think, I think you do, but let me remind you again. Uh, there's a song we used to sing when I was in choir and <coughs> <coughs> school. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Remember that song? Let there be peace on earth. The kind that was meant to be with God as our Father. Brothers, all are we. That's not true. It's a pretty song, and I don't mind singing it, but even as a boy, it's like, that ain't, that ain't correct. Because we're not born God's children. 
He said in Ephesians, we're born children of wrath. We are children of disobedience. Romans says the same thing. And Jesus, real blunt, your daddy's the devil. And he said that to a bunch of religious people. Your daddy's the devil. You're not born again, and your father's the devil. And that's the reality. So if the father, for all of us originally, was Satan, then we hear the lies, and it makes it real easy to be a liar. You know, that's, that's just the reality. And so you take that thought into mind. This is the characteristics of a liar. He's influenced by a naughty tongue. Well, who is constantly bending our ear and putting thoughts into our hearts and our minds? Satan or his, one of his demonic hosts, one of his demonic beings. And, and quite honestly, I think we need to pray against that even as Christians. And then the last part of this, we close here tonight, talk about the consequences of lying itself. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 5. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness or a liar shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Here's a reality, the consequences of lying, you will never escape punishment. Again, that's just what God says. Somehow, some way, you, you, can, you can insert a name, someone that you think is a royal liar, and it seems like they're always getting away with their lies. God says, contraire, they will not go unpunished. I get frustrated. I, I follow the news, and I, I know some of our folks do not. Quite frankly, sometimes I think maybe I shouldn't do this because it just it gets discouraging. But when you look at the word of God, he says that you won't, they won't get away with it. So all this stuff that sometimes discourages us with all the lies we hear, especially in the political realm, God says they won't get away with it. And then verse 9 of chapter 19, and this is our last verse for tonight. Well, second to last verse. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Shall perish. That liar would be put to death. And that made me think about what we're told in Revelation 21. So we'll close with Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 21 and the 8th verse. In Revelation 21 verse 8, the Bible says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death they will perish you look at someone and you say that person has gotten advantage all their life by lying their way through their life they've taken advantage of people and they seem to succeed God says they're not succeeding they're going to perish and they're going to be put in the lake of fire. Don't fret over that. Don't fret over that. Don't fret over those who seem to lie their way through life and get advantage of life because of it. Because their doom is sealed unless they repent and turn to Jesus Christ. So all these verses, you bring them all together and it kind of paints a picture of what God really thinks of lying. And he doesn't think very highly of it, does he? So what does that mean to you and me? Well, since you and I are born-again people, we better not allow our mouths to begin over to lying. Not even the little white lie. You know what? And I have to be cautious, too. You, know, you can embellish things. You can embellish truth. And embellishing a truth is really a lie. And there have been times I've been convicted about that. It's like, you know, did I kind of embellish that? You know, we all got to be careful. Sometimes you don't want to tell the truth because you think it's going to get you in trouble, but you, you're getting yourself in big trouble when you lie. It's always right, always right to tell the truth. There was a story of, I can't remember, it may have been Corey Ten Boom. Of course, you know who the Ten Booms were. They hid Jews in their home until the family was caught and then sent to uh, uh, concentration camps. I think all of Corey Ten Boom's family died. On one particular occasion, I can't remember if it was her or her sister, they had a panel in the uh, landing of their stairwell 
and behind the panel was a it was a, like a false wall, and they would hide Jewish people and then close it. So when when they were raided, Gestapo raids or whatever, you know they didn't see anybody. So, and then this one German said to the Ten Booms, "Are there any Jews in here?" And the girl, being taught that you don't lie, said, "Yes, they're right there." So the guy I looked at the wall and like, "Yeah, right, okay," you know. And she she was telling the truth. They were right behind that panel. But obviously, he was thinking, well, this girl's just off a rocker or something. She told the truth, and at that point, escaped. Later on, they would not, but she just decided, you know, no matter the consequences, tell the truth. And that should be my heart. That should be your heart. No matter the consequences, tell the truth. Tell the truth. As you raise your children, those of you who have children at home right now, teach your children to tell the truth no matter what, no matter what. Father, I thank you for what we've heard from your word tonight. And I just ask that you would take what is heard and use it in our lives for, for good. Lord, I, I certainly don't expect that anybody here has a, a problem with lying, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded, and certainly doesn't hurt to be reminded that those who do seem to get advantage through life by lying truly will not win out in the end. So, Lord, help us, help us, Father, to be people of honesty and truth, Lord, help us to be people who, who speak an encouraging word to others, to, to minister to others in a special way. And God will thank you for it. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty.